Good morning and Merry Christmas. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Elkin, a community of faith that seeks to love, live, grow, and go like Jesus. Regardless of who you are and where you've been, everyone is welcome, really. If this is your first time with us, we feel honored that you've chosen to worship here today. After the service, we'd love to meet you out on the front lawn and answer any questions you may have about the church. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our Facebook viewers. Though we wish you could be with us, we're thankful you could join us online. If this is your first time viewing the service, please let us know in the comments below. Here are a few things you need to know this week. Two weeks ago, Scarlett Jasper came to share with us about her work with Together for Hope in the Appalachian foothills of Kentucky. Throughout the month of December, we are collecting the annual offering for global missions. Our goal is $1,600, and those funds will go directly towards the work that Scarlett is doing. Today is the final Sunday, so if you'd like to give, you can mark your check or off offering envelope, Global Missions. Christmas decor will be taken down today, Sunday, December 26th at 4 p.m. If you can come help us with Boxing Day, it would be greatly appreciated. This won't take long, and the more hands we have, the less time it will take. We'll see you at 4 p.m. If you have an announcement that needs to be shared in next week's Need to Know, please email Justin by Tuesday of this week. God bless, and welcome to worship.
Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are so thankful to be together again today. We gather to celebrate uh, that the light of Christ is here and you are alive and well in us and in our church and uh, in the message that we proclaim and the mission that we live out together here at First Baptist. Lord, so many of us have spent this weekend with those we love, surrounded by friends and family, and for that we are thankful. For some, Lord, we acknowledge that the past few days may have been lonely, but I'm thankful that your light shines on all of us and that you have made your presence known to each of us. Today, O oh Lord, we're thankful that your love has no boundaries. Our lesson today from Luke's Gospel is all about growth. It is about transformation and obedience. You have called us to follow you, Lord, through all of our days, and today we are eager to learn from your sacred text. And we trust that we will all leave closer to you than when we arrived. We also gather, Lord, to say thank you. For when we have wandered, you have always found us. And when we've gone out way ahead of you, you've reeled us back in. We worship you today, O oh God, on this, the first Sunday of Christmas tide. We worship you for who you are. And we ask that we leave here today as the people that you have called us to be. We pray together in the strong name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. And in that name we worship. Amen. Amen. Please join me in this morning's responsive reading. Praise the Christ child, the newborn prince of peace. We are here today. We are the Lord of Christ. Praise to the God who has come to us in the flesh. We are here Praise to the Spirit who calls us together to serve. We will be set we are no longer afraid. Come, let us worship God. Please stand now if you're able and join me in singing our call to worship, hymn 88, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
morning. Do we have any other children? It's just us, Anderson. Good morning. Are you happy today? I got some questions for you. Have you ever lost something and then found it? Did you lose your shoes this morning before you came to Sunday school? No. I sometimes lose my phone. Even when I'm talking on it, I think I've lost it. Isn't that silly? Well, how about your mommy and daddy? Have you ever seen them lose something and they look and they look and they look and they can't find it and they get all worried? Where is it? They get upset. Have you ever seen that happen? Your grandma and grandpa, maybe? <laughs> well, sometimes when people lose things, they get very upset. And our story today is about when Mary and Joseph takes Jesus to the temple. And the temple is a big church. And they're on their way home, and Jesus is 12 years old. They're on their way home, and they can't find him. And they look and they look and they look and they're worried and they're scared. They're afraid. Where could Jesus be? So they go back and they find Jesus in the big church, the temple. And he's talking to the teachers there. And it turns out he'd been there the whole time. He wanted to be there. And once Mary and Joseph found him, they weren't afraid anymore. Jesus knew exactly where he was going to be and why he was there. He wasn't scared at all, kind of like you when you weren't scared at the, on that roller coaster. Jesus wasn't afraid. We know that because the Bible tells us that that's what Jesus said to Mary and Joseph. Jesus wasn't lost, was he? He, he knew where he was supposed to be. He knew he was in the temple, and he wanted to be there with the teachers. And this 12-year-old Jesus, we see all the qualities that he had when he was a grown-up man. Qualities that invite people to follow him. And that's a gift that we have. A gift that we have that Jesus gives us. In our world today, when people get lost and they lose their things, and people feel lost, it's a good thing to know that we have Jesus right here in our hearts. And that Jesus is with us all the time so we don't have to be afraid. Isn't that right? Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for Jesus who offers us the gift of always being with us. Thank you. Amen. Anderson, I have a little gift for you. And it is a magnifying glass. Would you like to come and get it? You know what you do with that? You can hold it over paper and it makes words larger. I bet they'll show you how to do that when you get back to the nursery. Well, let's give some more and y'all can all three play with one. Okay? But you know what's important to know? We don't need a magnifying glass to find Jesus. Jesus is right here with us all the time in our hearts. Thank you, Anderson and all the children on Facebook. Please join me now for our hymn of praise, hymn 93, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear.
Will you join me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of another day. You lift us up and have blessed us with the ministry of this church. We thank you for our pastors and teachers who nurture us spiritually. We thank you for each member and for the fellowship we share. Father God, our hearts are full today as we have seen the unfolding manger scene in Bethlehem. Because of this great gift, we have the promise of new life. As we turn our hearts toward gratitude, let us give freely, generously, and with eager hearts. Thank you, God, for this sacrificial gift of love through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And in his name I pray, amen.
Our scripture this morning is Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. The boy Jesus at the temple. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Did you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. These words are the gift of God. Thanks be to God. And Mary treasured all these things in her heart, the text says. Every mother knows a few things about treasuring things up in your heart. The good, the bad, and even the ugly, right? In today's lesson, Mary and Joseph learn something about parenting, but they also learn something significant about where their son is in his development as the Messiah. He was the king of the Jews from birth, but this morning we celebrate that, that Jesus had to grow up. Luke offers us an invitation to consider Jesus living out his vocation as the Messiah in the context and in the dynamics of a real human family with real human challenges and in a very real human world. Thankfully, the scene in Luke 2 ends very well with Mary and Joseph and Jesus back together again after they lost him for three solid days. Thankfully, he wasn't just lost, but he had intentionally stayed behind and they find him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And apparently these seasoned elders had been asking Jesus a few questions too because we learned that they were, and I quote, amazed by his understanding and by his answers. And Mary, the text says, she was astonished when she found him, yet for different reasons. She didn't join them in their applause, but scolded him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you with great anxiety. In a few moments, we'll explore Jesus' loaded response. But first, I'm led to ask a very basic question. Perhaps you're asking the same one. But how could this happen? I mean, talk about an epic parental failure. They didn't just leave behind their son, but the son of God. It's true, though. Life happens, doesn't it? And sometimes we get lost in life. And sometimes we even lose our children in it. Have any of you ever lost a child? It's a real question. Have any of you ever lost a child even for a frantic few seconds? A hand going up? Definitely some eye cutting and finger pointing in the sanctuary right about now? Because we all know there is no worse feeling than losing a child. There is actually a picture on my brother-in-law's cell phone of an unattended stroller sitting all alone under the stars on a large piece of recreational turf outside of some high-end stores in Pigeon Forge next to a few gas fire pits. The good news is it was a very nice area late in the evening with very little foot traffic. The bad news is Katie stepped into a store and I assumed that she took Anna Lee with her. Of course she left her with me. But I walked Anderson across the turf lawn and put him on a Christmas train with his cousins. And there she was, 
in her stroller, all wrapped up in a blanket, resting peacefully under the stars, all alone. And about four minutes passed before I joined Katie in the store to the realization that Anna Lee was missing. And we rushed out and we found her and my brother-in-law with the stroller. And he said, are y'all looking for something? <laughs> Photographic evidence of our mishap from a distance saved on his phone for an eternity. Thankfully, when you're traveling with extended family, you can rely on one another to help out. But Mary and Joseph were not so fortunate. To answer your question, yes, Anderson's parents have lost something, Sharon. <laughs> but Mary and Joseph were not so fortunate because they were traveling with a much larger family, hundreds of people most likely, and they weren't on vacation, but they were on a pilgrimage. The Jews were expected to take three pilgrimages, Pentecost and Passover and for the festival of booths. They were a devout Jewish family. And Jesus, in this text, he's a big boy. He's 12 years of age. It was reasonable for them to expect that since he was on the verge of manhood or covenanthood, we might say, which would have been the age of 13, that they could have trusted he and his buddies to stay along with the crowd. But when they regrouped for the night, Jesus failed to show up at his muster station. And to their credit, it didn't take them three days to realize that he was missing. But since they had already traveled a full day, it took them a full day to trace their steps back, and then when they got to Jerusalem, it apparently took them another full day to find him. Upon their return to Jerusalem, it undoubtedly looked a lot like many modern churches on the Sunday after Christmas. The visitors and large crowds have now departed the scene. The decorations remain, but the party had ended, and many of the folks who may have seen Jesus in Jerusalem have also departed. Did they leave with Jesus? Has the Messiah been kidnapped? This was chaos, and they looked everywhere, I'm sure. Have you seen this little boy as they flashed hand-drawn photos around every corner about yay tall and about this big around? He was uh, articulate and thought-provoking, wearing a dark robe and, and sandals. Haven't seen him. What about you to the merchants sitting in the marketplaces and storefronts to the street beggars? They surely ask everyone, have you seen our little boy, Jesus? And then they stumbled into the temple. Maybe they thought they would find him there, or maybe they were just distraught parents in need of sanctuary. But that's where they found him. And Mary didn't know whether to wring his neck or wrap her arms around him. Any of you parents ever felt that way? Undoubtedly, Jesus could have been in a lot worse places, couldn't he? But he was still a 12-year-old boy who had disregarded the instructions of his parents, who surely told him not to wander from the group. Her heart was glad, but her heart was also breaking, not just because Jesus had been disobedient and had worried them, but because the angel told her who Jesus was and what was to become of his life. It's at this point in the narrative where it seems that Mary is being confronted with Jesus' purpose and his future, after Mary scolds Jesus for abandoning the caravan, saying, your father and I have been looking for you, Jesus says, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? That hurts. He calls Mary you. doesn't even refer to her as mama. And he isn't referring to Joseph here either. He's referring to God as his father. William Barclay writes that Jesus gives the identity of father to God. He flips the script, and in essence he says, don't you know what I'm about and who I am and why I'm here? Of course Mary knew. Well, the angel had already told her, but letting go of Jesus must not have been easy. This undoubtedly marks a great shift in the story. From this point forward, his father is God, and Joseph, for instance, isn't mentioned anymore. We must not discard the detail that the boy Jesus, and I quote from the text, went down with them and came to Nazareth, Nazareth and was obedient to them. As Barclay also writes, that because he was God, it was only appropriate that he do what he was supposed to do. He doesn't look down on humble Mary and hardworking Joseph, but Jesus shows them fidelity and he shows them gratitude. You know, I'm always pre cautious when I'm preaching on this text because I certainly don't want to suggest in my comparison that Jesus was just another 12-year-old boy or that this is 
just another family. They were undoubtedly special. They were undoubtedly called, and they were anointed for a, for a very specific and, and, and special purpose. Yet each and every single one of us who were here on the first Sunday of Christmas tide, we are also special. We are called, we are anointed, and we have very specific purposes that we're called to live out in this life. Jesus wasn't just another 12-year-old boy, but Jesus was a 12-year-old little boy, and this was a very human family, and Jesus had to grow up, and they had to grow up together if he is ever going to make it to his first sermon. That's really about all we know about the Holy Family and the boy Jesus from his dedication in the temple as an infant to the age of 12 and then a significant gap from the age of 12 until around 30 years of age at his baptism. The silence in the story was more than some of the early writers could stand. Some of you may remember, you may have read the infancy gospels of Thomas which paint uh, uh, port pictures, portraits of the boy Jesus as a miracle worker of sorts. For instance, the Jesus in those texts, he makes birds out of mud that fly away and he strikes another boy dead after that little boy destroyed a mud dam that Jesus constructed in the creek. It really is an entertaining read, for sure. Of course, it has long been deemed among the pseudepigrapha, or fictitious, and the canonical Gospels make no such accounts. The Gospels only leave us with this image of Jesus from infancy to his baptism as growing, increasing in wisdom in years and in divine and human favor. I don't know about any of you, but I'm encouraged that Jesus had to grow up. I'm encouraged that by the time he shows up on the scene in the River Jordan, Jesus has done some, some growing up. And then from that point forward, Jesus continues to grow up. It's a lifetime of learning. Jesus learned some of the first lessons of his ministry out in the desert, being tempted by the devil. He learned those lessons when he went back home where he had to experience the pain of a prophet, the text says, who was not welcome in his own town, growing pains. He came face to face with grief, just like us when, when he lost his buddy Lazarus. The text tells us that Jesus wept. And Jesus even stuck his foot in his mouth. I think he probably learned something from it when he encountered that Canaanite woman who he likened, when he likened the Samaritans to dogs, and she said to him, do you remember? But master, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus said, said, said woman, the child shall be healed in this instant. Jesus also knew, knew a few things about anger. He learned a few things about anger. Have any of you ever wanted to walk into a church and turn the pews upside down and the tables upside down? I confess I should whisper this, but there are a few churches where I'd like to go turn the pews upside down, but I don't. Jesus did, on the other hand. Jesus learned something about betrayal. When even his closest friends slept through his final night before his crucifixion, while another friend sold him to the temple authorities, and yet another flaked out and said he didn't even know who he was during his trial. All of these experiences were more than just Jesus living into messianic prophecies of old. In fact, as the church, children of God like Mary, these are the stories that we treasure in our hearts, aren't they? Because they all reveal to us that Jesus spent his life learning what it means to be human. He was always the Messiah from the cradle to the tomb, yet he was always wrestling with the same stuff that you and I wrestle with. Transformation and growth in Jesus didn't happen overnight, and it does not happen overnight in us either. But the gospel writer wants us to know that Jesus grew, and Luke 180 proclaims that, that the child grew and became strong in spirit. The next chapter repeats the statement, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And, and again in Luke 2.52, he grew. And that's what God wants for each one of us here in the church. You know, some folks started growing in their faith when their parents dedicated them as infants. There were others who came to know who God was, and that growth began when maybe they were teenagers and baptized in the, in the river, the waters of baptism. Then there are others like my friend Craig, who went on to be one of the finest deacons I ever had, who 
around the age of 70, walked the aisle, made a profession of faith, and I baptized him. That's the thing about growth. It always starts out as a seed, as a moment of, of realization, of Emmanuel, of God taking up residence within us, but then the Holy Spirit nurtures that seed within us and enables it to grow from and through the various seasons and experiences of life. It's been said that the first step to being like Jesus is being human. Now that's really good, isn't it? The first step to being like Jesus is being human. And we've all definitely got that part going for us, don't we? The next step to being like Jesus is surrendering our purposes to the loving purposes that God has for each one of our lives. It is God's yearning for each of us that we will evolve and grow continually into who God has created and purposed and fashioned us to be. Oh, Jesus, he came from pretty good stock, didn't he? I'm not referring to his heavenly ancestry, but rather his mother Mary, who accepted the mission that this angel abruptly placed on her path. When Mary was told that she would bear the Son of God, she said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me according to your word. And Jesus will echo some very similar words on the night of his betrayal when he says, If this cup can pass from me, let it. But not my will, but your will be done. See, the scriptures are filled with story after story of those who laid aside their will and their yearnings for the will of God in their life. The scriptures also reveal story after story of those who chose to go a different path, who chose to go their own way. You know, it's hard to blame some of those who Jesus encountered for refusing to make the journey with him because he is pretty radical, isn't he? But we have to give the temple leaders of his childhood some credit. In today's text, they made room for the little boy in their temple. And in their hearts, they made room for this 12-year-old little boy. And this is an image, I think, that should challenge the church. And I, and I commend you at First Baptist Elkin. You all have, uh, have done so well over the last several months especially to make room here in worship for the little children. And some Sundays we have one, and some Sundays we have 15, but doesn't it say something about who we are that we make space, sacred space, for the children? But you know, when Jesus shows up in the temple the next time in the text, at the age of 30 to preach his first sermon, they literally tried to hurl him off a cliff. That's a direct quote. Then and now, change is hard, isn't it? Growth is hard. Learning something new is, is, is hard. Learning something different is hard. When Jesus comes back to the temple to preach that first sermon, he proclaims, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It came straight from Isaiah. They all knew this passage of Scripture, but they could feel the tides turning in this one who claimed to be and who was the Messiah, out healing lepers and feeding the hungry and challenging the unjust structures of the empire and telling them parables about a coming kingdom and how they were, many of them, on the wrong side of justice when they thought they were actually God's people. It was more than they could stomach. I'll never forget one particular youth minister that we called among the string, a string of several in my first congregation from Wake Forest Divinity School. He was from Hiawassee, Georgia. And being from Appalachia, he talked a whole lot like me and a whole lot like the other folks in that rural congregation. And I just knew that they would love him. And they, they really did love him. And, and they still do. He's pastoring a great church now in Shelby, North Carolina. But one day, early in his ministry, there I was out in the parking lot and a, a very well-meaning fellow said, well, y'all better enjoy him while you can because by the time the divinity school gets finished with him, he'll just be ruined. I thought it was funny. Maybe you didn't. <laughs> I love that story. And I think it's our tendency to want Jesus, however we understand him, to stay in whatever manger we've put him in wrapped up in the same swaddling clothes of our own youth and traditions and of our own culture. You see, they wanted Jesus to keep regurgitating stuff they had always heard and everything they had always learned in the temple from his own boyhood, but when radical love and grace and mercy took root, 
and was personified in him, they wanted him dead. You see, this Jesus, infant holy, infant lowly, as the hymn proclaims, when he moves from being just the object of our worship to the very source of our being and the radical example by which we follow, some would say that this Jesus has the capacity to ruin us. But the truth is, what Jesus came to do is to rescue us and to bring to ruin the empires of this world that are defined by all the wrong values. Mary sung with this boy still in her womb that God has shown strength with God's arm. God has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their heads. This is the Magnificat. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things. And God has sent the rich away empty. When we look around on this the first Sunday after Christmas, just as Mary and Joseph went a day's journey without Jesus, we look at our society and we see how preoccupied that we have become with this world, a world that St. Paul proclaimed is, was and is, the, 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 represents the principalities and powers of darkness, and we too have left Jesus behind in so many ways. Yet, as the church, we gather to proclaim that Christmas is not just a season of evergreen and holly leaves on the calendar one day per year, but it is the beginning of a liturgical year, Advent and Christmas, where we yearn for God to take up residence with us, within us, in fresh ways. As we worship together on the last Sunday of this calendar year, and as we all look forward to the year of our Lord, 2022, can you believe it? It is upon us. It is our hope that Jesus' radical love of stranger, that his definition of the poor and prisoners and his definition of, of the hungry, that all of the above will continue to challenge us and to empower us and to evolve us and to transform us. We too have been called in every season of life to grow year after year and to continue maturing into the likeness of God discovering again and again who it is that we and our families have called to be for such a time as this. Because when Jesus gets left behind and becomes an afterthought in our lives, the world descends into darkness and we descend with it. I don't know about you, but there are some things that I did really well in 2021. And there are some things that I did really poorly in 2021. And there are some things that I want to do better next year, the year of our Lord, 2022. In today's text, Mary and Joseph accidentally left Jesus behind. It was an epic parental failure. But let me tell you something about Jesus as I bring this sermon to a close. Even at the young age of 12, the narrative of Scripture finds him faithful. Jesus was right where they left him. As we prepare for a new year, there are areas in your life where Jesus has been left behind. I assure you that he's right where you left him and you'll find him faithful. Friends, there may be times in the new year when you feel like this world has left you behind in the dust. None of us know what the new year has in store for us, but we do know that we can always turn to Jesus who will always be right there, who we can always find faithful God's, faithful to us, God's faithfulness to us. Do you know what that is? That is grace. Grace from a God who knows everything that there is to know about being human and living in this human family. That is the good news of the gospel that we celebrate at Christmas. So grab him by the hand on this the first Sunday after Christmas, on this the last Sunday in 2021, and join me in celebrating Christmas all year long. Because Jesus is not just a baby. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. A God who is with us in life. That's the message of Christmas. But also a God who is with us in death. And that, my friends, is the message of Easter. Thanks be to God. This is a God who refuses in life and in death to ever leave us behind. So now as we embark on a new year together, family and friends, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, as the First Baptist Church, 
of elk. And I want to leave you with the words that my father in the ministry, uh, much wiser than me and dear mentor of mine, Reverend Jim Hamblin, well into his 80s, health not great, and every time I leave him, not knowing whether it's going to be the last time that we see each other or, or not, he always smiles and he looks at me and he says, wherever you go and wherever life takes you, make sure that you go with God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As Lance comes to lead us in our hymn of response today, if you have a prayer need, something that may be concerning you as we go into a new year and you want to come share that with me, I'll be here to meet you down front. Maybe there are commitments you need to make for the first time, recommitments that you want to make, or maybe you want to join our church and, uh, and what a beautiful gift to us this Christmas and way for you to prepare for the new year. Whatever the need may be, we'll be here to meet you down front as we lift our voices in song and celebration. M105. Christmas to each of you. We have two special things we want to do before we go, uh, one of those being the benediction, the second being a very brief concert, you can be seated, sorry, a very brief concert that we've got queued up from uh, our First Baptist Church of Elkin Play School, uh, and this is a gift for, uh, for each of you. So, uh, so we want to uh, watch this video now, and then I will give a very special benediction, and then Joyce will, will, will lead us out with the postlude.
happened for our first Baptist play school. Um, for Pat Eaton uh, and for all of our all of our teachers, Cindy Newman, and so many of them who uh, make such a difference in the lives of our children and, and in the lives of these young families, and we continue to celebrate uh, can celebrate them in all the all the ways that that we can. And it's our hope that maybe next year we can actually have them with us in in, in worship, and they can lead us in that in that concert in person. Our benediction is from two poems by the great theologian Howard Thurman entitled The Work of Christmas and the Mood of Christmas. And I share this every year and I'm probably going to continue to share it every year because the words are so profound. So may you receive this benediction. When the song to the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, to make music in the heart. Christmas is waiting to be born, where refugees seek deliverance that never comes, and the heart consumes itself as if it would live, where children age before their time and life wears down the edges of the mind, where the old man sits with mind grown cold while bones and sinew blood and cell go slowly down to death, where fear companions each day's life and perfect love seems long delayed. Christmas is waiting to be born in you, in me, in all mankind. May each of us take these words of Howard Thurman and this challenge with us this day. Amen. Amen.